Welcome back once again to the First Christian Symposium on Aliens. Our next speaker is Dr. Michael S. Heiser, Ph.D. His website, I won't take a lot of time with the biographical information to give him all the time he can have, and you to ask all the time needed for questions. Michael S. Heiser, H-E-I-S-E-R.com is his website. He's been a regular here at our events for many years. We thank God for him, and we thank God for you being here to hear him. I hope it's a big blessing to everybody. Come on up, Mike. Okay, yeah, thank you for coming. Uh, I would add uh, to what Guy said by way of introduction. I have to get used to doing this with my left hand a little bit here. Um, if you go to the website, you'll notice that I have uh, several blogs that I uh, regularly contribute to, probably once or twice a week to each one. There are four or five of them divided into different subjects. One of them is called UFO Religions. So the, the other way to find me, if you don't remember the URL, is just Google UFO Religions and blog, and you're going to find that. You'll be able to get my uh, contact information off that. If you want to email me a question, that's fine. I, I do check email, try to answer it. Might take me a while, but I will do my best to get back to you. I wish I could see the audience because uh, going into this topic, I agree with everything. Is Lynn Marzulli still here? Is he in here? Okay, that's good. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I agree with everything Lynn said when, when he said uh, about how you know we need to sort of take the onus and introduce our pastors to some of these things so that they, they get acclimated to the issues and the questions and, and whatnot. But at the same time, uh, I feel a little bit of angst about our responsibility. And uh, I'm, I'm a little less inclined to leave pastors completely off the hook. And some of the things I will say here today will make that evident. I'm not trying to um, really be confrontive in any way, um, maybe a little bit. <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of known for that in, in kind of a offhanded sort of way. Uh, but I do really think that pastors ought to sort of take the first turn to be interested in the, in the wider culture, uh, in the culture in which their people live, in the culture in which they live. And there's a certain burden of responsibility on their part to engage that culture and to pay attention to what people are saying within their church and without it. And you're going to see how this relates as I get on into the slides. My topic is, as you can tell, why an extraterrestrial God appeals to today's culture. And Guy's instructions were to make this sort of an introductory uh, message. So there may be some of you out there that aren't quite convinced that there are really that many people interested in this subject or that are sort of caught up in it. Uh, there is a lot of interest, and I want to go through uh, some slides to establish that. And then I want to spend the, the rest of the presentation on how the issue of UFOs and aliens for many people really displaces anything that you would think of in terms of traditional theism, uh, whether, and theism is a broad term, can be you know, any book religion, any, 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 any religion that accepts a god, but even more specifically Christianity. Uh, I have had the experience personally of being at conferences, and I've had a number of people come up to me and say, I used to be a Christian until, and then they would relate to me some experience they had, or an experience of someone that, that they knew, that they trusted, that they just had, there's no reason this person should lie to me. I've known them X number of years, or they're a family member. And what they proceed to tell them really sort of alters their paradigm. And then they're confronted with a choice. Well, do I believe this, or do I believe you know, what my faith has taught me? Maybe I should go talk to my pastor. A lot of them do. And a lot of them get dismissed or laughed at or maybe, maybe you need therapy or something sort of condescending or dismissive. And that, those sort of events sort of trigger a, a new path for many people. And they begin to, to process the UFO ET issue, uh, not in terms of I really need to dig into this and find out what it is, but they, they embrace its reality almost by default. And that begins to, in their mind, displace their view, their, their cosmology, their worldview, and, and ultimately their faith. So I want to talk about why, to those people, that makes sense. 
And I hope that you'll be sympathetic to what they're thinking and also that you'll be moved to um, perhaps do a better job uh, on your own uh, in study of Scripture and especially for those in the ministry that it would motivate you to, to start thinking uh, more seriously about this. So with that introduction, there is a growing interest in all this ET stuff. And I have a number of polls here, samples. This is 1947 U.S. Gallup poll. Of course, 1947, a very deliberate year, very deliberate choice on my part. And each one of these polls is going to go in chronological succession. If you look at the questions here, what do you think these flying saucers are? Now, this poll is given sometime after, uh, you know, we've had the Kenneth Arnold sighting and, of course, the Roswell event. And there's a certain amount of newsworthiness of it all. And so they take this poll, and you look at the responses. I don't know, 33%, imagination, almost a third, uh, hoax, secret weapons, so on and so forth. Other explanations, 9%. If you look at the, the list here, the other explanations is, you know, pretty much, you know, the alien uh, view. But a lot of people had heard, if you look at the bottom, 90%. Uh, had at least heard of flying saucers, but nobody was really processing them in terms of an extraterrestrial idea, at least initially. 1957, do you believe there's some possibility that they, the saucers, may be objects from outer space? Now we've crept up to 25% that are, yeah, you know, I, I think that's, that's possible. Here are some more Gallup polls. You look at the years. The years from these samplings are 1966, 73, 87, and 1990. And the reason there are gaps in the panels here is because not all the same uh, questions were asked and, and the results given in the sources I had, so I spaced them out that way. But the three questions here from the poll, have you ever heard or read about flying saucers? Well, it's, it's consistently 90% or above. You know, you have a gap 96 in 1966 to 90% in 1990. It's a new generation. You know, you have young people in the, in the poll, so there's a variance there, but it's still plus 90. In your opinion, are they something real or imagined? And it, it's consistently hovering now, just 10 years after uh, the 57 poll, you get almost 50%, and then the rest of the polls seem to hover right around 50%, that yes, they're definitely real. And then they threw in another question, are people somewhat like ourselves living on other planets? And that has essentially climbed from about a third to almost half. Now, if, you know, this is 1990. If the you know, statistical trends are, are gonna be consistent, if roughly half the population of the United States today believes that, yeah, you know, there's probably, you know, life forms, ET out there living on other planets. There's something like us. That's a lot of people. And my guess is, is that some of those people are going to be in your church. I mean, just the odds are that you're going to get that. 20th century polling, American Astronomical Society. This is Peter Sturrock. That's a familiar name in UFO studies. Does the UFO problem deserve scientific study? certainly or probably 53%. Again, this is a, a, a poll of astronomical professionals. Are you willing to contribute? You know, we see the stats there. And it's, it's probably more of an interest than you would think among the nuts and bolts people. Poll of women, 1978. Does other intelligent life exist in the universe besides on Earth? 50% said yes. A lot of the other Gallup polls were uh, statistics were restricted to men, so I threw this one in. Optical, optical Spectra, this is a trade magazine, trade journal. Uh, I, I picked this one because I don't want anyone to get the impression that it's just the, the non-science people or the non-scientists or the non-elite, the non-university trained that believe this stuff. It isn't true. Are these planets uh, other than ours, are there planets other than ours uh, with advanced forms of life? Highly probable 63%. Do you regard the popular notion that some UFO reports may in fact be sightings of space vehicles from other civilizations? Quite conceivable, 42%. Usually you see more of a drop off there. Uh, but again, you're still probably somewhere between a third, 40%, even of, again, those who are scientifically trained and minded are willing to, to link the UFO thing with the broader question of could there be life 
on other planets. If you spend any time uh, listening to people like Seth Shostak from SETI or reading SETI literature, they really want to separate what SETI's doing from what you're doing here in Roswell. Uh, they want a, a real dichotomy there, but if you just ask sort of anonymously off the record, you get a higher percentage. Scripps Howard News Service, Ohio University. Do you feel that flying saucers are real and the federal government is hiding the truth behind, about them from us, 1995? If you combine the very likely to somewhat likely, you've got 50%. Again, it just it tells us something about that. Do you believe in UFOs? Now, when I see a question like that, it's pretty poorly worded. Um, yeah, there, of course there's UFOs. There are things in the sky. You don't know what they are. You know, I mean, who would deny that? So the, the question really is aimed at, do you think they're extraterrestrial? And right, you know, we get our 50% fairly predictable counting. A couple more, Newsweek magazine, again, in the high 40s, close to 50%, concealing information. Do you think UFOs are alien ships or life form? 20% lower than, than before. Marist Institute is kind of interesting because this is a this is a polling institute that's run out of uh, a, a Catholic college, a religiously affiliated college. Do you think there's intelligent life on other planets? Again, 60% now. Do you think life on other planets is more or less or about as intelligent as human life on Earth? More. Are our galactic neighbors friendly? 86%. And very high. Now those are popular polls. There's actually been growing interest in ET life and religion specifically that is more part of academia. So I want to say something about that. Typically, when you come across studies on how somebody's belief uh, in the extraterrestrial nature of UFOs or uh, alien life or connecting the idea of alien life with flying saucers, when those kind of surveys intersect with religion, they usually focus on how people who are religious, who are serious about it, might react to the disclosure of a genuine ET reality or how such disclosure might affect their beliefs. And I've pulled out a couple of these. The Brookings Report is one you've probably all heard of. Uh, this wasn't specifically a, a study about religion, but it was in part, uh, part of it commented on the religious effect of what might happen if all of a sudden the world, specifically the United States, for the sake of the, of the survey, the report, what the reaction might be if it was all, all of a sudden disclosed that, yep, you know, there are aliens, they've been coming here, they, they pilot flying saucers, that sort of thing. And it was very negative. Uh, the Brookings report concluded that this would just be a, a result in a, in a tremendous upheaval of the world's cultures, and specifically in the United States, conservative Christianity, that the term fundamentalist is used in the report, that this would really uh, rock their world and cause incredible social upheaval. And so you'll often see this report referenced by, um, in the context of the disclosure question. You know, why don't they just tell us, why doesn't the government just tell people what's going on? And the answer is usually something like, well, it's, it's just gonna freak too many people out, especially those religious people and they're just not going to be able to handle it. So that becomes a rationale for you know, concealing something. Of course, there's other rationales. Alexander UFO Religious Crisis Survey, 1994. This one was featured on Coast to Coast AM at the time it came out. And this one uh, was a little more optimistic. It, uh, it, it, it cast religious people as being a little more accepting certainly than the Brookings Report uh, would indicate, but also uh, just in, in general. And it was sort of viewed as a move toward proving or providing evidence that disclosure wouldn't be that big of a deal. There was a Roper poll after that in 2002. That, this was actually done for Scientific American, UFOs and ET life, Americans' beliefs and personal experience. Again, that also had a few religious questions in it, again, aimed at uh, those who would practice, you know, some sort of faith, and it was very broad. Uh, so was the Alexander uh, Religious Crisis, UFO Religious Crisis Survey. Basically, they're including uh, traditional monotheistic religions like Judaism, Christianity, Islam, but then they're, they're also going to have Eastern religions in there. Same with the Roper poll. And so it was, it was pretty scattershot, and, and the poll was criticized 
both of these, and I was one of the criticizers uh, here a few years ago in Roswell, um, in the early, early 2000s when Ancient of Days started, because neither of these polls included people that I, uh, my background is I'm, I'm, a, I'm trained as a biblical scholar. I taught in Christian colleges. I taught in universities, biblical studies. And I, you know, since a teenager, I've grown up, you know, teenager and beyond, you know, in the context of what we would loosely call evangelicalism, even though that term doesn't really mean a whole lot anymore. Uh, basically, people who would take Christianity seriously in a, uh, in a, you know, the major doctrines, the idea of evangelism, that sort of thing. Uh, not, not any of the mainline uh, broad denominations. But I knew there were, there were people in that context that would give dramatically different answers to some of these poll questions. And so my gripe at the time was it just doesn't, it, it's, it's not an accurate reflection of what people would really think. And along the, this last year came the Peters ETI Religious Crisis Survey. If you do go to my blog, uh, you could search for this. I have the link up there, and you can just Google that. Peters, uh, Ted Peters is a, is a famous uh, scholar involved in the academic study of the interface of science and religion. He teaches at Pacific Lutheran uh, University and graduate school. Uh, he might be retired now. Uh, he, he might still be there. Uh, Peters has written a number of books, a number of articles on this subject, and he was the first to really include specifically as a specific category, evangelicals. And the results he got were kind of interesting. Um, over what, his survey sounds a lot like the older Alexander uh, crisis survey. People thinking, oh, it's not going to alter my worldview at all. I mean, the high percentages for, for what we would think of as Bible believers. You know, like 80% are okay with ideas like, if there are aliens that come here and tell us that they had a hand in creation of humankind, would this alter your beliefs or not? Oh, no. No, I'd be fine with that. You know, and I, I read the results of that. And he, he has all of, the, uh, all of the results tabulated and put in nice little Excel uh, graphic you know, pictures. You can go, look, go up to the website and look at them. Questions and results. And I thought, boy, you know, either we have people... We have churches just filled with people who just don't know much about doctrine at all. Or there's some fudging going on here. Or people are really sincere. They really, they really mean what they're saying. They would still cling to their faith, not realizing how it, it really is impacted. And I looked at the at the survey as kind of an improvement, but also a little bit disturbing. And it sort of drew me into this, into this thought process of, you know, it went from why, you know, why is this all of a sudden sort of acceptable into, you know, if people really thought about this, could they really, could they really discern the difference between what is put forth by, I'll just call them the, the ET believer community uh, the first church of extraterrestrial deity, and traditional Christianity. Could, you know, are, why is this so hard to parse? Why are people so sort of willing to, yeah, you know, I can accept this idea. I can sort of swap ET in here, and, you know, it's pretty much the same thing. And so that's what, what got me thinking about this. And, again, my, my complaints are that I think we're dealing with people who are sincere, but just quite, not quite processing their, their own faith very well. And frankly, I think that is the, that's the fault of pastors. Let's take the question off the table of should pastors be involved in studying this stuff. I think they should, just because of the, the worldview influence it has for no other reason. But in my, where I work now, I work for a Bible software company. And we interact with, with people who are interested in the Bible at all levels, from the new convert, you know, the <clears throat> a mom who wants to use, you know, incorporate biblical study into her homeschooling, all the way up to the guy, you know, who teaches at Oxford. Okay, that we have somewhere around six hundred thousand customers at all levels, and we get to interact with all of them. And it's alarming to me what 
what people don't know about Scripture. And so one of our sort of mental missions is we need to really strive to provide tools to make this better, to help out here. And I process all my conversations with people, you know, against things like this, because this is floating around in my head too. And it's really disturbing. The, the last note here on the Barna poll in 2009, if you have not read this poll and its results, I really strongly encourage you to do so. <coughs> Many adults who claim to be evangelical Christians, this is the result, this, this is the pollster talking now, know very little doctrine and basic, de, basically develop their own beliefs about biblical theology. I'm going to post this, this presentation on my website when I get home. That's why I put the See Here link. You can download this and look for yourself. So I really think you should read the poll. A third of people not believing that the Holy Spirit is real. These are people in evangelical churches. Not that he's not a person. That he's not real. Okay? I mean, you, you just get responses like that. And Barna focuses on polls. He's a professional pollster, but polls that apply to the to the Bible-believing church, the evangelical community. So with this as a backdrop, I think there's really been some religious fallout, and the church needs to come to grips with it and understand why. It sounds like it's a church-them question. You know, why do people you know, accept E.T. as a deity? Well, surely none of us would do that. Well, I want you to understand the people that you put out there who are doing it, who have committed themselves to this, and understand why. And I hope you are sympathetic. I hope you can see clearly why it makes sense to them. But I also hope that you see, with a, with, with a church as theologically and biblically illiterate as the church is now, how even within the church, it would be very easy to swap ideas, to swap biblical theology for E.T. theology. Now, a couple books that you might want to consider looking at if you get interested on an academic level. UFO Religions, edited by Christopher Partridge. I've blogged through parts of this book on my blog. Uh, Partridge is a, is a scholar, religious studies scholar. I don't know what his uh, faith commitment is, if any. But he's one of the, one of the several scholars who are really serious, uh, who are you know, really interested in the UFO religion aspect. This book on the right, The Gods Have Landed, looks sort of cartoonish. It is not. It's a serious scholarly book. I recommend that as well. And it, it'll take you into all aspects of how, how faith systems develop out of belief in ETs and UFOs. Jody Dean, another scholarly work, Aliens in America. Brenda Denzler, The Lore of the Edge. Lore of the Edge. Subtitle there is Scientific Passions, Religious Beliefs, and the Pursuit of UFOs. This is her Duke University dissertation in religious studies uh, published. Uh, again, these are, these are sort of highbrow titles, but they're readable. Children of Ezekiel, uh, the subtitle here, if I can pick it out. Aliens, UFOs, uh, the crisis of race, and the advent of end time. This is also another dissertation that has been published. And it relates to uh, how belief in UFOs and extraterrestrials have been processed in apocalyptic terms, not just within the Christian community, but within other religious communities as well. ET culture uh, is a scholarly work. A lot of it deals with uh, religious questions, how this would impact religious beliefs, and some other peripheral sorts of things, you know, operating on the presupposition, well, if there's extraterrestrials, how would this affect, affect our lives, affect our culture? Now, if you read the scholarly literature, scholars tend to divide people who are interested in UFOs in, into four groups. There's the materialist. Okay, I would describe these people, these are agnostics or atheists. They're kind of the nuts and bolts people. They're interested in it from a technological point of view or a physics point of view. Again, nuts and bolts kind of people. SETI would be an example. Yes, you know, we think ET life is out there, but we, don't, we really don't like UFOs. Then you have the physicalists. These are the people 
who see UFOs as real alien craft from other worlds and that have been coming to Earth for millennia and they're responsible for the world's religions. Now, if you've ever read any of these authors, Sitchin, Von Daniken, this is where they're at. They believe it's physically true, physically real. They've been coming here thousands of years and they're responsible for Jesus and Muhammad and Buddha and you know, fill in the gap. They're responsible for all this stuff. And again, they, I think they, they sort of stick to, they really have to stick to the idea of an alien being someone from, some being from another planet as opposed to interdimensional or some of these other ideas, you know, demonic hypothesis. So you have the physicalists. They're really committed to that view. Theosophical, theosophy is a, a branch of occult studies, uh, broadly defined. Occult and esoteric mystical traditions and motifs. You, this, uh, this view would essentially say UFOs are spiritual entities. Here's where you get into the sort of metaphysical idea of beings coming from other dimensions and that sort of thing. And not using that to process it in biblical terms, but using, it, using that to process the idea in mystical, occultic, esoteric terms. Uh, UFOs are spiritual entities, spirit guides. It's very uh, shamanistic. Abduction experiences are cast as shamanistic experiences. Uh, even despite the, the violence, they're, they're almost, they're a moment of religious conversion in the sense that, like, like with shamans, uh, the gods have chosen you and they're going to afflict you. It's going to be sort of a trial by fire, a trial uh, to see your worthiness to get this information, but they're going to give you this information and you begin to feel special. You begin to feel like a conduit for secret knowledge and that sort of thing. Again, a very, a very mystical approach. This category overlaps a bit with, um, I say a bit, in some people's minds with Christian stuff because of a guy named Emanuel Swedenborg. How many of you have ever heard of Swedenborg? Just I see hands going up. Uh, Swedenborg was a clergy, clergyman. And he's probably the oldest modern example of someone, theologian or not, uh, who wrote about, you know, this is in the late 1600s, wrote about uh, contact with extraterrestrials, with alien beings. He actually uses terms like that. Then you have what the literature calls, and this is not my term, but I'm going to use it because I think it's fairly descriptive even though it's used pejoratively in scholarly literature, which is unfortunate. Christian fundamentalist, UFOs are spiritual phenomena. Yeah, we agree with those theosophists. It's spiritual, all right, but extraterrestrials are demonic manifestations, and they're also the source of that theosophical junk. Okay, and of course, this is going to be the dominant view uh, present here at the conference, as you've already learned if you've listened to the speakers already. So you get these four categories. Uh, I, I personally uh, don't feel like I fit exclusively into um, any of them. I'm certainly not a materialist. I'm certainly not a physicalist. Uh, I'm really not a, a, a theosophist either. I don't like that because I'm not into the occult, you know, other than to find out what they think. Uh, I think there's a missing category here that I would call eclectic. And that is, I think there's more than one way, uh, biblically, we can look at extraterrestrials. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're not demons. It means that's, I think, I think many of them are. But there could be other ways uh, to process it. So the, the scholars don't have the eclectic category because they like to pigeonhole people. I want to focus, though, on these two. Materialists and theosophists. At first glance, you would think, what in the world do these people have in common? Because the one is the nuts and bolts crowd, not interested in anything religious, and the other one is very mystical. Uh, it, it's my opinion <clears throat> that these are the two groups that I think currently dominate the culture in terms of people who are interested in UFOs. And if you look at them, they dominate the culture. The culture is a combination of materialist and materialist paganized uh, belief systems. They appear that, like, like they're at odds, but they're not. If any of you follow uh, sort of current 
theoretical physics or metaphysics. There's a lot of talk now among the mainstream scientific community in terms of physics, how everything got here, that is very mystical. And that's not actually new. I mean, it's, it's, it's new in terms of how it's filtered down to the popular culture. But for a long time, you know, this whole idea of the, that the Earth or the universe is a living organism. It's sort of the Gaia hypothesis on steroids, okay? That the universe itself is a living organism. And it, it, it came about because it, 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 it was always there. It produced itself in some mystical... You know, scientists won't use the word mystical but they'll try to justify it on, in, in terms of quantum physics and things like this. You start seeing a blurring of the lines between these two. At the bottom here, I think the two will be united and really already are except for the empirical gap where spirituality is shown to be entirely natural or material. And this is where I think the ET issue is critical. Because if ET displaces, if it can consistently and coherently displace what we think of as the spiritual, if the natural displaces the spiritual, okay, natural beings, they had to evolve somehow. You know, they're, they're, they're beings that can live and die and, and all that sort of stuff. If that idea... Let's say we were to actually get disclosure that there really are extraterrestrials. It's assumed that they would be so superior that they get elevated to deity status. When that begins to happen, when that idea takes hold, and I don't think you need a flying saucer to land on the White House lawn for that to happen. I think it's very, it'd be very simple to trigger this. Um, but once that happens, the materialists are satisfied because, well, yeah, they are gods, but they're the product of evolution. You know, they're technological beings. They're dependent on their technology. We can learn from them. Maybe we can be like them someday. We don't need God. We have them. And you can get the physicalists under the umbrella, too, and the physicalists will pipe up and say, yeah, yeah, they've been here a long time, too, and they're responsible for all that religious stuff. And the, and the materialists would say, well, you know, we used to think we were kooky, but you know what? Now that we're looking at an extraterrestrial, or NASA has admitted that there are extraterrestrials, or NASA has admitted the idea that there really are sort of advanced life forms out there, so that's all you need. Because mentally, people will extrapolate for you. The culture's already prepped through mass media, through decades of exposure to this. They're already prepped to hear the magic words, yeah, you know, a couple missions back, we found something that, you know, we thought it was microbial, and it was. It was microbial life. And then, then we looked a little bit more. We made a few more missions. And sure enough, you know, we're, we're seeing advanced life forms in terms of cellular development, multicellular things, and you know, even things that we would, you know, would be able to hear on Earth to pick up and look at with our hands. And, you know, that's all that needs to be said because the culture is so in tuned to believe uh, in random, purposeless you know, Darwinism and the idea that this is how life gets here, this is how advanced life gets here, that all of these groups can coexist very nicely if the idea, just the idea, is affirmed in the mainstream. That's all you need. Because then the, the materialist can look over at the physicalist and say, yeah, we used to think we were kooky, but hey, you know, I'm holding a, an extraterrestrial life form here in my hand and anything's possible. You know, it makes me want to reconsider, you know, some of those stories. And, you know, boy, an artificial structure here or there, or at least something that's said to be artificial on Mars or the moon or something like that. And, you know, who knows? That's all people need. That idea alone will displace God, as, as you know, if you're a Christian, as you think of him. It's very easy to do. And the theosophists are happy because, yeah, you know, they've been, they've been coming here and, you know, they're such higher advanced beings that, you know, they can just manifest themselves. You know, they, maybe they come in crafts, maybe they don't, you know, that kind of thing. And you know, they gave us Jesus, and Jesus is giving us all this truth because all those other beings, they've been to other worlds, and they've seen all this stuff, and they're so spiritually and ethically advanced. Everybody's happy. Everybody's happy. You know, we can talk about how book religions 
okay, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, could very easily buy into that as well. Just a simple, low-key, low-level disclosure. Very easy. Now, we're not there yet, but people are already redefining theism with ET. Now, I'm going to plug Bill Allner's book here, our next speaker. If you want to, a, a nice, compact, concise record of the messages that ET contactees get from the extraterrestrials or during abductions, and really how theologically pregnant the language is and how specifically it's aimed, uh, in many cases, I think directly aimed at, at Christian theology, Bill's book is it because he's cataloged a lot of that. Aliens Adored uh, by Susan Palmer is a book that focuses on the, uh, the Raelians and Ra Rael. And you'd get an insight into his cosmology. Rael's important for really, I mean, a number of reasons, but one of the most is that he has a sort of a fully developed cosmology that really tells you where he's at. And what they say often mimics, you know, in, in some areas, what less notorious uh, UFO believers believe. UFO religion, this is inside a UFO cults, culture. I'll give you the same thing by Greg Reese. But I want to go through here and, and try to sh give you the rationale. And I, I, I'm, I'm, again, I'm just hoping that you see how, how easy it is to believe this. If you're a Christian, I want you to think like a Christian when you see this, because I'm going to create some touch points. John Saliba is a Jesuit scholar. He's a sociologist. And in one of those books, The Gods Have Landed, he has a, an article, an essay, on religious dimensions of the UFO phenomena. And this is a paragraph from that, that essay. He notes, UFOs can readily function as a religion for several reasons. They deal with important and ultimate issues in human life. They contain references to beings such as gods, supernatural heroes, angels, and devils. And they appear to have a spiritual or transhuman nature since their presence is not susceptible to modern empirical investigation. In other words, you can't put them under a microscope. How many times have you defended your faith by saying, well, you can't disprove that God exists because you can't put him under a microscope. You can't recreate. You, know, you can't do the scientific method. On him. It, 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 yeah, you, that's true. You can't. It's true here, too. If anybody asks you, when you go back home to your church or your family or whatever, you know, you're a Christian, why are you interested in this stuff? Write that out and show it to them. Hand it to them. Okay, that's why you should be interested. It's all the big picture stuff that we hold to theologically, except we fill in the gaps. We fill in, fill in the creator, the, the, the deity to be worshipped, the deity that gives salvation, the deity that knows the future. We fill those gaps in with the God of the Bible. All you need to do is change what fills the gaps. That's all you need to do, and that's what people do. So let's, let's go through some examples here. I would, I'm going to try to break these up into outright replacements that uh, UFO, again, I'm calling them UFO believers, again, people who, who really, extraterrestrials for them really are their religion. They're, they're their gods. They, they get their, their whole worldview from this now. There are ways that they, they outright replace certain components of theism and Christianity. And then there are other ways that they just sort of swap in substitutions or at least parallel certain doctrines and ideas. Let's talk about replacement. Ineffability. Anybody know what that means? Go ahead and shout it out. Right. Can't, it's, it's beyond sort of the, the terms of description that we have. It uh, defies a description. So it's, it's unknowable. Incapable of being known or understood or defined in any coherent way, which is why in biblical theology, God tells us that you wouldn't know anything about me and get it right unless I told you first. Okay, this is where the doctrine of ineffability derives from in terms of, of what the Bible says. Examples of God revealing himself, Exodus 3.14 is pretty familiar. This is the burning bush incident, I am that I am, so on and so forth. 
where that particular divine name is revealed. Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong unto the Lord. In other words, you can't know my mind completely. The only thing you can know is what I tell you, what I instruct people to write down. Other than that, you're guessing, and you're going to guess wrong because I'm not like anything else. This is why the Israelites were not supposed to make any graven image because God isn't like anything you can conceive of, so don't try. It's pointless and it's errant because God's going to be insulted by anything you compare him to that's in your created little world. Isaiah 55, my thoughts are above your thoughts, so on and so forth. Now, UFOs and ET are ineffable in the sense that the nature, now just think about this, the nature and intentions of the aliens are really unknown and they're unknowable. A religion has tended to offer explanations to questions beyond science. See, that's, that's, that's one of the roles, as, as secularists would look at religion, one of the roles of religion is to answer questions that science can't, to fill in those gaps. Well, I would suggest to you that for the ET believing community, that's exactly what ET does for them. They are beyond the edge of science. Where science stops, they begin. Okay, where so what science cannot answer, they already know. Okay, they fill in this gap. There's no need for the God of Israel, the God of the Bible, if we have ET. Transcendence. Transcendence refers to something being either remote or superior to human existence of a radically different nature, you know, absolute superiority. Now, there's a positive transcendence. You know, God possesses certain attributes that we do not possess, even in part, and they're, he's so other than we are. And then there are negatives, where God does not have the limitations that we do. Okay, so there's, there's, there's two sides of that coin, transcendence, beyondness, greatness. Here's a quote from Salaba. Although UFO occupants are described as if they had physical bodies, they seem to be spiritual or psychic, you know, some kind of material, immaterial, something in between. Their nature appears to be radically different from that of human beings, surpassing it not only in degree, but also in kind. They are utterly different Okay, than you, or, and that's either because of what they are in terms of species, as, again, UFO ET believers would describe their experiences, or because they have evolved to such a higher state that they're, for all practical purposes, are a different species. Okay, either, either way you get there, you get there. They are transcendent compared to us. So we don't need God for that. Body like Jesus, you know, this is often uh, used in comparison about how Jesus gets into the upper room, you know, without, you know, any doors or windows, and you apparently pass through walls. He has a different sort of, it's a physical body, but it's different than the body he had before, you know, all that kind of talk. And E.T. is often described in the same way, especially in abduction narratives. Again, this is a, this is a point of transcendence beyond humanity. Imminence. The opposite of transcendence uh, is often described as imminence. As transcendence is God is so other and out there, imminence is the idea of closeness or relationship. Biblical theism makes it clear that the transcendent God comes to humanity. This is a this big theme in the Bible. You know, God takes the initiative. He reveals who he is to you because you ain't going to find out any other way and get it right. So he takes the first step. He reveals himself to you in various ways to Israel, to the church, you know, to believers at large. And, you know, there are, there are, I don't want to call any of them mundane, but there are less spectacular ways God does that all the way up to the incarnation, okay, and, and with Christ. The, the role of the Spirit is also dealing with imminence when Christ, of course, that was sort of the ultimate uh, the incarnation is the ultimate experience of imminence for uh, only a certain number of people, the 12, and then anybody else who got to meet Jesus. When Jesus leaves, what does he say? I'm going to go, but then I'm going to send my spirit. And the spirit inhabits believers. 
And that is the idea of imminence, that God is no longer in a tabernacle, in a temple, on a mountain, some other place. He is not temporarily walking among you as a human being, but he is in all of you, each of you, into which the Spirit comes in response to your faith. So it's, it's a really important idea. E.T. replaces both through repeated contact to the abductee. And it doesn't have to be abductions. It can be a presence. You'll often refer to, or hear uh, contactees refer to uh, sort of a presence either in their mind or their head, their memory. Again, there's the, 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 the times of direct contact. There are the messages uh, that, are, that are given uh, to, the, to, the, to the person who has been contacted. That person is supposed to disseminate that information. And oftentimes the ETs are described as, again, not coming to them sort of in a face-to-face -face way, but filling their minds, you know, sort of a channeling idea. For someone who has had this kind of experience, they're frankly not really interested in the Holy Spirit because it's just not as spectacular. It's just not as, you know, holy cow, you know, I, there's like something sort of taking over my head here or my mind. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a substitute, it's a replacement for that kind of idea. And even if you haven't experienced, what is, the, what is the ET messenger telling you? They're here for you. Okay, they become the prophets and apostles. And they're the ones that tell us, those who haven't had the direct experience, that they're here for you. They're, they're, they're going to come in full force one day to save the planet or they're giving you the instructions you need to save the planet, and they're watching. The, all, the whole idea of constantly watching. See, now we believe that about God. Okay, but the trick here is that in the, in the contact team message and in his or her theology, and what they're trying to convey to you, you know, quite sincerely, is that ET is, you know, just beyond, you know, either our, our our five senses, or beyond, you know, where NASA can detect them, and they're watching. They're here. They're not going to leave until the job's done. They're here. It's not like Jesus who was here and then left. It's not like this spirit thing that I don't know if I've ever really felt that. You see how feeling-oriented it is, okay? It's very easy for the ET message to fill this gap, and that's, that's what it does. Omnipotence. If you've noticed, all I'm going is I'm going through traditional attributes of God. That's all I'm doing. Omnipotence, of course, limitless power. Alien technology is cast as so other than anything we can conceive that nothing seems to be beyond their grasp. Any task we could conceive of, any problem we, th we could think of that needs to be solved, of course, they could do that. Look at who they are. Look at the ships they have. Look at the, the whole thing of conquering space. I mean, you know, there, there's a certain, there, there's actually a number of trajectories that provide different rationales to make a, a, an extraterrestrial being, even though they would acknowledge that it was created somehow, product of evolution or something. The perception is, is that these beings are, are practically omnipotent compared to us. Anything we need, it's within their grasp. They can, they can do it. They appear to have mastered the laws of time and space. You know, how's that for a good definition of deity? As well as being the source of anything needed. God is intellectual, moral, and spiritual perfection. Not only do aliens have unsurpassed mastery over the forces of physical nature by which they could easily overpower us, you hear that argument all the time, they have the abilities, psychic powers, that speak of spiritual perfection. That they don't annihilate us speaks of their moral and spiritual quality as well. So not only are they in terms of techno technology virtually omnipotent, in terms of their character, they are all you know, all intellect, all ethical, all, you know, fill in the blank. Even, and you say, well, how in the world can, can people, you know, say that? You know, in light of all this abduction stuff, if you, this is why people want to separate UFOs from abductions. Many people don't like the connection. 
But even those who presuppose the connection will view the abduction experience as though it were a shamanistic or spiritual conversion. You're put through the fire, to use the language of Job. You pass through the fire, and you come out as gold. Okay, You come out as a messenger. Do you think when Isaiah or Elijah or Moses, when they encountered God, were they scared? Yeah. <laughs> okay, they were scared. Um, it wasn't fun. It wasn't normal. It wasn't comfortable. And so the attempt is going to be made to, again, strike parallels here with those kinds of experiences. Substitution. The reality of a higher being. Uh, this is probably one of the more obvious ones. Paul noted in Romans 1 that each human had an innate knowledge that there was a God, something beyond himself. You know, theologians like to call that the God-shaped void in every person. E.T. fills that void by virtue of his transcendence and technological omnipotence. He is practically deity, and he, and he really is deity to, to many. Theism's explanation of origins and that of science are not only at odds, again, and this presumes, of course, a real strong view of um, literal creationism, that, that's more apparently at odds with science than other variations of creationism. They're not only at odds, especially, again, with respect to causation, but each feels like half a solution. I want you to think about this. There are many people who are, you know, who are experiences or people writing to defend an ET worldview, you know, again, as religiously speaking. They'll say theistic views of origins are earth-centered and man-centered, humanity-centered. They fail to include what is beyond. I mean, if, if you've spent any time in this subject, interacting with you know, those you know, who would hold, again, an ET, uh, ET as deity view or an ET cosmology, you're, you're bound to run into this. Well, you know, the, your Bible is just, it, it's just so man-centered. It's so earth-centered. It's so human-centered. What about everything else? What about the bigness of the universe? The Bible doesn't have anything to say about that. I mean, that's just a, a huge flaw you know, in, in, in what the Bible is. It, it, it's just it lacks comp a comprehensive feel to explain everything that is. So it seems like only a partial solution. But then you look at the scientists. Science, on the other hand, has all but reduced the human race to a slightly more advanced evolved sample of the animal species. That is, it bestows no cosmic significance to being human. And boy, the ET message is really big on that. Okay, transcending humanity, the next leap of human evolution. It's another reason why ET is here, to make you like them. What they are is possible for you. You're on the, you're on the verge of this little you know, upward, upward uh, trajectory. You know, science bestows, bestows no cosmic significance to human beings, nor does it assign any special destiny for human beings. It's natural selection. You live, you're going to die, might improve the gene pool, okay, and something else is going to take your place. Life goes on, you get put in the hole, and you know, the species will reproduce, refulfill itself, replenish the earth <clears throat> until something better evolves and comes along and wipes it out or displaces it or becomes dominant. That is just a Darwinistic view. UFO and ET cosmology actually unites the two and feels like a better solution. Its answer to cosmology is all sweeping and all encompassing. It is not just earth centered. It includes every life form everywhere. And not only that, but it doesn't look, even, even if you know, you're gonna be like a physicalist like Sitchin and say that the aliens had to come down and monkey, you know, with some sort of primate or whatever it was and transform it into humanity. And I, I don't want to be too mean there with Sitchin because there are some Christians, you know, who would take that view as well. That's how they would view special creation of humanity, 
while also en encompassing a, an evolutionary idea. Because they still want to maintain special creation for humanity. It's just, that for, for them, it's God. For Von Danik and Sitchin, it's the extraterrestrials. But apart from that, you know, you have this sense that the aliens are really, really interested in humans. You know, the experiment's really gone quite well. I mean, even better than we thought. You know, but now they're kind of getting messed up and they're, they're, you know, experimenting with weapons and good grief, we don't want them to kill themselves and then we have to start all over, you know, and they're destroying the planet, you know, all these traditional uh, ET contact messages. But they want us to survive because they, they've, they're sort of invested and they want us to become like them. Or, or it's going to be a few, just like uh, Lynn was talking about the, the movie Knowing. If you haven't seen that, you need to see that. Uh, that is, that is, it's a physicalist cosmology. Um, only a few, those who, as the movie puts it, only those who heard the call are allowed to come and repopulate the new heaven and earth. Okay, those are the contactees, those are the abductees. Okay, so, but either way, there's a, there's a, there's a positive, wonderful destiny for human, humanity, despite what we've done to ourselves. Again, both Testaments describe encounters, divine encounters, otherworldly encounters that are life-altering. And you have this concept of conversion and of calling, of, of mission. The literature on ET contact and abductees is widely agreed again on the nature of this experience, whether it's painful or not. Again, despite the suffering in abduction experience, many abductees feel called, considered a positive life-altering experience uh, in many ways. Again, not everybody, of course, but a lot of them do. They have a personal sense of divine care. I've passed the test, or I'm serving a higher purpose. I'm willing to put my life on the line for the better of humanity. Isn't that what the apostles did? Isn't that apostolic? To be willing to die for this, for the betterment of future generations. It's a personal eschatology. It's a personal salvation. Now the New Testament, of course, speaks of the recreation, or the recreation of the heavens and the earth, and of all things made new. It speaks of glorified bodies that believers receive. You know, the, the ET believer would, wouldn't use the phrase glorified body. Maybe it might, might sound too Christian. But this whole idea of becoming as they are, becoming like them, becoming more than human. Again, you get the same messages. The last note here, ET messages of accelerating human evolution, transhumanism, transcending what it means to be human, is a real substitute for glorification. And it's a destiny that, that every, every human being can participate in, or so the message goes. Now, here's where I've debated within myself to get into this. Why, why is the ET redefinition so powerful, and what is the remedy? I would say that the reason it's powerful is because we lack a real sense of the, of the drama of Scripture. And, you know, personally, if the cosmic narrative of the Bible and biblical theology isn't as exciting as this stuff, it's our fault. You know, it's the fault of the professor, it's the fault of the pastor, and, you know, the people in the pew. But personally, since I'm, you know, I can't say I'm in the ministry because I'm not ordained, I'm not a pastor or anything like that, but, you know, sort of. You know, since I've been trained for this, I feel that I ought to lay uh, most of the blame on the people who've been trained to minister to others. It's your fault. If you lack the interest or the skills, or the knowledge, or whatever. Just the stick to uh, to make Scripture as thrilling as it is. You need, to, you need to invest yourself in that. And I realize that pastors are so torn 
in terms of their time because of what people demand of them. I'm just like you, okay? You know, I'm in a church too where most of the people think theology is dull and boring. Okay, I get that. Um, we, we basically have become anesthetized to theology. And everybody keeps saying American Idol. Well, that, that's pretty much where the culture's at. You know, entertaining ourselves, you know, anesthetizing ourselves. And, you know, those of us in the pew share some of the blame. But I think, I think we can really make uh, a difference if we really pour ourselves into the word of God. And I, to do that, th- that involves risk. You know, we don't enjoy the depth and mystery of biblical theology because we don't know it. And I really believe that. Uh, we don't know it, we don't take the text seriously enough, or we open the text to get a warm, fuzzy feeling or a buzz. Okay, we call that devotions, and I'm not making fun of devotions, you need to read your Bible. But that's usually what it consists of. I'm going to read until I get a buzz. I'm going to read until I feel something, I feel a warm and fuzzy feeling. Or it's all about marital counseling. I'm married, I'm, afraid of, I, I'm in favor of a good marriage. Okay? I'm not advocating anything different. But if that's all biblical theology is, where you're at, then you need something else. Okay, you just need something else. Because I think even, even us, we are susceptible. Chances are there are a number of you, I, I know as I've thought about this uh, you know, for a while, I look at that list, and you, you sort of get the feeling that, boy, you know, is it just a matter of categories? Is it just a matter of what we put in the slots? Is that all it is? Is that what it comes down to? Okay. I mean, I can, I can parse this, and for me the answer is no. It's more than that. Okay, but for a lot of people, especially if you had, again, some sort of minimal disclosure idea, oh, it would be so easy to just... Well, here's how I'm going to process this. I'm going to make it part of my Bible and, you know, not intending to go all the way, but sort of, you know, kind of meshing the two. If you don't know, you know, if you don't have some depth in your biblical theology, it's very easy to do that without, you know, really knowing, without, you know, doing it unwittingly. And I think one of the things that, that plagues us is we want theological security, uh, theological teaching in most places is diluted down into a creed, a statement, a paragraph, a doctrinal, you know, one-page doctrinal statement on a website, and that's the Bible. And I understand because, again, I, I'm not in ministry now, but I've you know, ministered in many contexts in the local church. It's a lot easier for people to digest, memorize, commit to the heart, tiny, short formulations of doctrine. Just practical. Okay? I'm not anti-creedal. But I'll tell you, if you never go beyond that, if you never stretch your people beyond that, and the way you don't do that is you avoid tough questions. If you're going to keep avoiding tough questions, you're going to keep avoiding tough topics, if you're, going to, if you're going to keep skipping passages that are out of your comfort zone, okay, if you're going to keep doing those kinds of things, especially to big picture questions like the CT stuff that has so thoroughly permeated the culture, then what you've really done is you've told your people that this is the extent of what you need to know and think about. And it takes half an hour to memorize some of that stuff. Now I've canned it, I'm sitting on the lid, and I'm kind of bored now. I've mastered it all, what should I move on to? And you never move on. You go to church and it's the same thing every week. Every week. Okay, it just has to change. And there are things that are going to force it to change. And there are going to be Christians who can, can deal with that, can adapt to it. A lot of you in this room, because you're already ahead of that, Okay, mentally, you're already thinking of other things. You're thinking bigger thoughts because of what you're, you've allowed yourself to be exposed to, because of what you're interested in, and you've already started sifting. You're already, the wheels are already turning for you. 
okay? There are a lot of Christians out there that they're not. And frankly, the, the ET believer knows his theology to more depth and breadth than you know yours. Because it, it's, it's life-altering to them. And again, if, if scripture and theology isn't as exciting as this stuff, it's really the fault of the leadership. question, are people somewhat like ourselves living on other planets? And that has essentially climbed from about a third to almost half. Now, if you know, this is 1990, if the you know, statistical trends are, are going to be consistent, if roughly half the population of the United States today believes that, yeah, you know, there's probably you know, life forms, ET out there living on other planets, there's something like us, that's a lot of people. And my guess is, is that some of those people are going to be in your church. I mean, just the odds are that you're going to get that. 20th century polling, American Astronomical Society. This is Peter Sturrock. That's a familiar name in UFO studies. Does the UFO problem deserve scientific study? Certainly or probably 53%. Again, this is a, a, a poll of astronomical professionals. Are you willing to contribute... You know, we see the stats there, and it's, it's probably more of an interest than you would think among the nuts and bolts people. Poll of women, 1978. Does other intelligent life exist in the universe besides on Earth? 50% said yes. A lot of the other Gallup polls were, uh, statistics were restricted to men, so I threw this one in. Optica. Optical Spectra, this is a trade magazine, trade journal. Uh, I, I picked this one because I don't want anyone to get the impression that it's just the, the non-science people or the non-scientists or the non-elite, the non-university trained that believe this stuff. It isn't true. Are these planets uh, other than ours, are there planets other than ours uh, with advanced forms of life? Highly probable 63%. Do you regard the popular notion that some UFO reports may in fact be sightings of space vehicles from other civilizations? Quite conceivable, 42%. Usually you see more of a drop off there. Take the onus and introduce our pastors to some of these things so that they, they get acclimated to the issues and the questions and, and whatnot. But at the same time, uh, I feel a little bit of angst about our responsibility. And uh, I'm, I'm a little less inclined to leave pastors completely off the hook. And some of the things I will say here 
today will make that evident. I'm not trying to um, really be confrontive in any way, um, maybe a little bit. <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of known for that in, in kind of a offhanded sort of way. Uh, but I do really think that pastors ought to sort of take the first turn to be interested in the, in the wider culture, uh, in the culture in which their people live, in the culture in which they live. And there's a certain burden of responsibility on their part to engage that culture and to pay attention to what people are saying within their church and without it. And you're going to see how this relates as I get on into the slides. My topic is, as you can tell, why an extraterrestrial God appeals to today's culture. And Guy's instructions were to make this sort of an introductory uh, message. So there may be some of you out there that aren't quite convinced that there are really that many people interested in this subject or that are sort of caught up in it. Uh, there is a lot of interest, and I want to go through uh, some slides to establish that. And then I want to spend the, the rest of the presentation on how the issue of UFOs and aliens for many people really displaces anything that you would think of in terms of traditional theism, uh, whether, and theism is a broad term, can be you know, any book religion, any, 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 any religion that accepts a god, but even more specifically Christianity. Uh, I have had the experience Welcome back once again to the First Christian Symposium on Aliens. Our next speaker is Dr. Michael S. Heiser, Ph.D. His website, I won't take a lot of time with the biographical information to give him all the time he can have, and you to ask all the time needed for questions. Michael S. Heiser, H-E-I-S-E-R.com is his website. He's been a regular here at our events for many years. We thank God for him, and we thank God for you being here to hear him. I hope it's a big blessing to everybody. Come on up, Mike. Okay, yeah, thank you for coming. Uh, I would add uh, to what Guy said by way of introduction. I have to get used to doing this with my left hand a little bit here. Um, if you go to the website, you'll notice that I have uh, several blogs that I uh, regularly contribute to, probably once or twice a week to each one. There are four or five of them divided into different subjects. One of them is called UFO Religions. So the, the other way to find me, if you don't remember the URL, is just Google UFO religions and blog, and you're going to find that. You'll be able to get my uh, contact information off that. If you want to email me a question, that's fine. I, I do check email, try to answer it. It might take me a while, but I will do my best to get back to you. I wish I could see the audience because uh, going into this topic, I agree with everything. Is Lynn Marzulli still here? Is he in here? Okay, that's good. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I agree with everything Lynn said when, when he said uh, about how, you know, we need to sort of personally of being at conferences. And I've had a number of people come up to me and say, I used to be a Christian until, and then they would relate to me some experience they had or an experience of someone that, that they knew, that they trusted, that they just had, there's no reason this person should lie to me. I've known them X number of years, or they're a family member. And what they proceed to tell them really sort of alters their paradigm. And then they're confronted with a choice. Well, do I believe this, or do I believe you know, what my faith has taught me? Maybe I should go talk to my pastor. A lot of them do, and a lot of them get dismissed or laughed at, or maybe, maybe you need therapy, or something sort of condescending or dismissive. And that, those sort of events sort of trigger a, a new path for many people. And they begin to, to process the UFO ET issue. Uh, not in terms of, I really need to dig into this and find out what it is, but they, they embrace its reality almost by default. And that begins to, in their mind, displace their view, their, their cosmology, their worldview, and, and ultimately their faith. So I want to talk about why, to those people, that makes sense. 
And I hope that you'll be sympathetic to what they're thinking and also that you'll be moved to um, perhaps do a better job uh, on your own uh, in study of scripture and especially for those in the ministry that it would motivate you to to start thinking uh, more seriously about this. So with that introduction, there is a growing interest in all this ET stuff. And I have a number of polls here, samples. This is 1947 U.S. Gallup poll, of course, 1947, a very deliberate year, very deliberate choice on my part. And each one of these polls is going to go in chronological succession. If you look at the questions here, what do you think these flying saucers are? Now, this poll is given sometime after, uh, you know, we've had the Kenneth Arnold sighting and, of course, the Roswell event. And there's a certain amount of newsworthiness of it all. And so they take this poll And you look at the responses, I don't know, 33%, imagination, almost a third, uh, hoax, secret weapons, so on and so forth. Other explanations, 9%. If you look at the the list here, the other explanations is, you know, pretty much, you know, the alien uh, view. But a lot of people had heard, if you look at the bottom, 90% uh, had at least heard of flying saucers, but nobody was really processing them in terms of an extraterrestrial idea, at least initially. 1957, do you believe there's some possibility that they, the saucers, may be objects from outer space? Now we've crept up to 25% that are, yeah, you know, I, I think that's, that's possible. Here are some more Gallup polls. You look at the years. The years from these samplings are 1966, 73, 87, and 1990. And the reason there are gaps in the panels here is because not all the same uh, questions were asked and and the results given in the sources I had, so I spaced them out that way. But the three questions here from the poll, have you ever heard or read about flying saucers? Well, it's it's consistently 90% or above. You know, you have a gap 96 in 1966 to to, uh, 90% in 1990. It's a new generation. You know, you have young people in in the poll, so there's a variance there, but it's still plus 90. In your opinion, Are they something real or imagined? And it's consistently hovering now, just 10 years after uh, the 57 poll. You got almost 50%, and then the rest of the polls seem to hover right around 50%, that yes, they're definitely real. And then they threw in another